when it's over. That's the time I fall in love again. <laughs> All right, here we go. Another episode of the Front Row Podcast with Coach Mark Godfrey. And, uh, man, I've had such a ball uh, with all of my guests. But today, I always say this, but I'm really excited because it's a guy that I have great respect for. And uh, just to kind of let everybody uh, know a little bit uh, about Steve Kime. Steve Kime was the uh, general manager for the Arizona Cardinals for over a decade and had an amazing career uh, in the NFL. He played in the NFL, played football at uh, NC State, had a tremendous career there, uh, originally from the state of Pennsylvania. But uh, we're going to have fun today. We're going to break this down and talk a little bit about your journey. Yeah. And uh, but just to start off, man, thank you. Thank, thank you, you for coming in and thank you for being a part of the show. Thank you, coach. And uh, obviously, as a, an NC State alum, it's an honor for me as well. And I uh, obviously admired a lot of the work you've done over your career and big fan. So well, appreciate thank, you having me on. Thank you very much. You know, a lot of people uh, outside of the NC State world and, and you played there. Uh, they don't understand how passionate the fans are there, too. We'll, we'll get we'll talk about that one real quick yeah. here, because the NC State fan base uh, is really special. It's yeah. amazing. I know for you as a player and, and having, you know, played there and you've got roots there now uh, with, with the Wolfpack, talk a little bit about how fun that was for you just to play. Yeah, uh, man. I mean, it was I – mean, first of all, obviously, the opportunity to play college football at the Division One level is, is huge. And playing in front of 60,000 every week and, you know, having the opportunity to go to Death Valley and have that sort of inter-conference inter, uh, um, challenges, man, it was fun. And, and, and you know, the, the, the passion that the NC State fans come with, it's second to none in my opinion. You know, obviously, there's some of those SEC schools you can argue is a, is a little different world. But, you know, you got the doctors and lawyers at Duke and Carolina, but we got <laughs> – the farmers and the tech people at state and uh man they're a rowdy crowd they like their bourbon and their, their jim beam and and they get uh, they get into it certainly they got some great folks and great fans that are passionate yeah. i tell people all the time probably the most fat passionate fan base yes. uh in there so uh you know one thing i've learned about you steve you, you've got this uh it's an amazing work ethic but you have a uh you know to kind of build the career you did you know, as a, uh, you know, being recruited, obviously playing, playing in the NFL, playing in college, playing in the NFL, getting involved in the NFL, starting as a scout, working yourself all the way up yeah. the ladder, become a GM. You, you had to have and you do have this. And, uh, and most people that are high achievers like, like yourself, you've got this inner kind of drive and ambition and kind of toughness. Yeah. And um I'm just guessing right here, some of that came from your upbringing in, yeah. in Pennsylvania. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, Pennsylvania, obviously, I think molded who I was. And growing up, I was always enamored with being a, a, a general manager for some reason. I was not a very good student in school. I didn't care about school very much, unfortunately. I uh, just wanted to be a ball player. Told my mom when I was nine years old, I said, Mom, I'm going to be a general manager one day. I'm going to get a scholarship, and you're never going to have to worry about paying because we couldn't afford it anyways. <laughs> and um, she said, my mom just snickered, and she said, you know, if you worked on your math and your science as hard as you study these darn football <laughs> players, you may be successful one day. So I did the necessary things in the school and the academic world and uh, certainly got my grades together. Was had 30 scholarships coming out. Um, some interesting recruiting stories, as you can imagine. Um, your uncle recruited me at Pitt and um, obviously visited there and, and that sort of thing. But NC State, you know, I just fell in love with the, with the Raleigh area and, and the people down there. Um, but again, you know, just having the opportunity to play for the same coach. We were top 25 every year I played at NC State and had the opportunity to start for 36 straight games and two-time all-conference. And, you know, now then I'm be, I became a general manager and I realized that short arm stiff guard isn't who I want. I want the long <laughs> athletic guys that are natural knee benders, like, you know. I was an overachiever. Yeah. <laughs> I used to have people when I was at Alabama used to say, when I coached at Alabama, they said, Mark, I'm not sure you would have recruited yourself. No, I, <laughs> I said, probably not. <laughs> no, that's probably exactly, not. That's exactly right. Talk to me about, because, uh, you know, I got drafted by the Pistons years ago, yeah. but when you got in, into the NFL as a player, yeah. and that just kind of feeling of, uh, it had to be for all of us, but it had to be just an, an amazing sense, sense of accomplishment. Yeah. Like with somebody that they want you. Yeah. And, and the NFL, I tell people all the time, the, the NBA is amazing. College basketball, obviously, I love it. I've been involved for, for the, over 30, for almost 40 years. But the NFL, man, the NFL is big. Yep. It's big. No question. And there's nothing else like it. No question. And 
And here you are, you're a young guy coming out of NC State, yeah. and boom, now you got your opportunity, man. And uh, they call your name. I mean, there were so many surreal things that happened, Mark. I mean, number one, uh, the first day that I went to mini camp and practice, our starting guard was down. He was hurt. He was a little off-season issue. And um, I was thrust right in there right away, and I was practicing everything. And to get in the huddle as a Pennsylvania kid and to bend over and have Dan Marino call out the signals, you know, F right, scat, 34Z, whatever, I'm looking at Dan Marino going, <laughs> how in the hell did I get here? <laughs> And Danny was, you know, older and, and later in his career at that point in time. And just a surreal moment. I think after the first snap and I got bull rushed and he hit his finger on my helmet, I said, shit, I better get my stuff together. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was going to see a pink slip in my, in my locker. But, man, it was, it was a fun opportunity. I'll never forget that rookie class. It was Jimmy Johnson's first year, and we went in. And Zach Thomas was a good buddy of mine. He was a rookie. He was a draft fifth 5B. Uh, Larry Izzo was a free agent. And then here I was, you know, just this try-hard effort guy. And all of us laughed, and we'd drink beer and go down to the Fort Lauderdale Beach and hang out and all make fun of each other, saying, we ain't going to make this team. <laughs> well, lo and behold, you know, I stuck around for a little bit and had a cup of coffee. Zach Thomas goes to, to the Hall of Fame, and Larry Izzo is one of the better special teamers in the National Football League history, and now is a special teams coordinator in the league. Wow. Isn't that amazing? And then I became a GM, so I caught it on the back end. Isn't that unbelievable? Yeah, man. So, again, man, you're, you're – uh, the opportunity is there, mm -hmm. and uh, it happens in sports. It always, you know, it just is part of the game. But yeah. uh, you had some injuries in college, and then boom, you have some injuries now as yeah. you as you make the rock, you know, as you're there in the yeah. NFL. So talk yeah. about how tough that might have been to go through. Yeah, I tore my ACL twice. Uh, obviously, just had knee replacement surgery, and um, you know, it's just hard to get over that. It's, first of all, when you're a try hard player, anyways, but then you got to battle the obstacles of injuries. I mean, you just can't forecast those things, but at the same time, that's part of the luck of being a good player in the league, as you know, in basketball and football, any, any professional league, you've got to stay healthy. You can't make the club in the tub. How did you transition from playing to saying, you know what, I, I want to get involved in, uh, you know, um, I think you started as a yeah, scout, but yeah. just that transition, um, because a lot of guys struggle with transitioning, no you know, question. when they play, no question. after they pl after they end, and then now what do I do? And to some degree, Mark, I'm glad that I was 26 when that happened. I'm glad it didn't happen when I was 31, and maybe it would have happened a little later in my career. I always knew I wanted to get into, into the scouting uh, business, but I didn't know how to go about it. Um, so I was fortunate enough to go back to NC State when I left Miami, and they brought me on as a like a assistant strength coach. And lucky enough for me, that position entailed talking to scouts as they came in about future NFL players. And lo and behold, Torrey Holt was a senior. Mm. So Torrey Holt was a teammate of mine, became a senior. Torrey Holt became a great player, should be in the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. Sixth player picked in the draft that mm -hmm. year by the St. Louis Rams. Long story short, Everybody that came in, I told them about my sort of my, uh, my my dream and my goals in life. And fortunately enough, the Eagles, the Cardinals both interviewed me for a job. And then luckily enough, at 26, I started with the Cardinals as an East Coast area scout covering Maine to Miami. Mm. Unbelievable. So I, I, you know, spent about a year with the Mavericks scouting. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm walking into the gym every night. And and uh, first of all, every player on both teams mm -hmm. think they're going to the NBA. Everybody. Everybody does. And the reality is when I would go in, you know, as a, working for the Mavericks, there's one guy in the mm -hmm. gym. There, there's one guy in this arena that might play in the NBA. Yep. And the rest of them are good players, good yep. college players. Mm -hmm. But they're just not. And I used to get asked all the time, you know, Coach, what are you looking for? You know, even when I recruited in college, like, what are you looking for? Yep. And sometimes after, after years and years and years, I used to tell people sometimes, you know, I just trust my eyes. I trust my eyes. Mm -hmm. And then I used to say as well, you know, have a hunch bet a bunch yep. you know and i there that guy or you know he can do this or i believe in that guy so for you as you as you're scouting tell me a little yeah. bit about you know what that was like for you to begin and then how you developed yourself to understand and really evaluate yeah. talent yeah and i think you know mark one of the biggest things in, in the nfl is is i had to sort of build a rolodex in my mind of players that i've seen prior that have made it that have had success from a physical attribute standpoint now the whole other side of it is the mental side the mental capabilities the processing but you know early on as a scout i relied on my instincts and sort of the attention to detail and background information on players so you almost were more a little bit of a robot scout i think then as i've, I've sort of gotten wiser i learned there are so many things about player evaluation it's so inexact number one but number two is is we is i found out that the players that i missed on i missed on the person not the player there's always a degree of physical ability, but I was missing on two things you can't read on tape, the heart and the mind. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. I, now, I can see a guy's effort and the way they play the game, but at the same time, I don't know how much they love it. I don't know what their off-season preparation is like. I don't know what their daily preparation is like. But I can see the feet, the twitch, the movement skills. I can see all that. I can see the length, the athleticism. And that's why today's day and age, and I loved your podcast when you said, if I, I'm going to find you if you can play. Mm-hmm. Because we cast a wide net. I would go anywhere from Bangor, Maine, to Far- Fargo, North mm-hmm. Dakota when I was mm-hmm. scouting. I've been everywhere, everywhere in the United States, every square inch of it. And um, you look at the Hall of Fame inductees every year, the eight the guys that go in, say, for example. It isn't George, Alabama, and NC State. It's mm-hmm. Tennessee State. It's Morgan it State. It's right. Mississippi Valley College. Right. I mean, so they come from everywhere. And as you know, guys develop later in life at times. How, how hard um – because I did this at times too. I go back and look at you know thirty years of coaching and I'm recruiting players, and sometimes I would get fooled by talent. Oh, and it's easy to do. You know, you see a guy and man, is he good? And boy, his talent level is really high. Mm-hmm. And sometimes when their talent level, and, and we all need great talent, you know, to to win. But sometimes I think if I look back, maybe I didn't put as much of an emphasis on the things you're talking about, like because mm-hmm. you're, you're so you're, you're you're swallowed up in that talent, like yeah. wow, you know. But then you kind of miss on those other things, the intangible no things, question. like you talked about. Did you see that sometimes? Hundred percent. I mean, number one, uh, supply and demand at both on all these sports is, a, is an issue. I mean, when you think that there's a lot of talented players out there, just go ahead and run an NFL draft. And you realize once you get to the third round, you're starting to see a lot of holes in these players, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. So now all of a sudden you lose a degree of athleticism or something's missing in that guy. So you got to hang your hat on something that you love. And a lot of times you had to realize that it was going to be character or those sort of things. But that red flag always, the bells and whistles were things that I always said, you cannot ignore red flags after I learned my lesson. There was a kid out of Ole Miss named Robert Kimdichie. He, we were, had the 26th pick in the draft. He was a defensive tackle. He was arguably the most talented guy in the draft. Red flags all over the place. Okay, The guy had a lot of off-field stuff that I should have been concerned about. We had a defensive line coach that said he could live in my basement if he doesn't do the right things. <laughs> this will tell you about the NFL. A year <laughs> later, he brings the defensive lineman into my office and says, I can't coach this kid anymore. I said, what happened to your basement? Did it flood? <laughs> You know, it's like that, but that's the NFL, man. You get enamored with the ability and the talent, and it, it, it's enticing, and you just want to go grab it, but you cannot ignore the red flags. Yeah. And, and usually, and we all have them, you know, some players. It's just trying to figure out exactly. But you know what, though? The one thing, Mark, that I thought that I got over, for example, uh, my first draft in 2013, and I never thought I would do this. Um, I was sort of going into the process a little more conservative. My first draft, I got to be careful about who I pick. And a guy named the Honey Badger. Tyron Matthew coming out of LSU, kicked out of school, multiple failed tests. Mm-hmm. So I'm sitting there, I don't even want to watch him on tape. So I throw him on tape because I have to do my due diligence. Mm-hmm. And next thing you know, everything I'm saying, wow, mm-hmm. oh my God. Mm-hmm. The ball is just jumping in his hands. He's just, his anticipation, his ability to drive on the ball, his vision, his, his ability to play with instincts day after day after game after game is just off the charts. Mm. Never seen anything like him. And he mm-hmm. wasn't the biggest or fastest guy, mm-hmm. as you know. Mm-hmm. He just was a playmaker. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm sitting there, I'm like, shit, what do I do here? <laughs> I fly him into Phoenix. Todd Bowles, our defense coordinator, and I meet with him with my son, who was at eight years old at the time. We were at a steakhouse. Patrick Peterson was there. He was a little corner for us at LSU. He's hit me in the back. Oh, I got him, I got him, I got him, I got him. My son pulls on my shirt halfway through dinner. He said, Dad, man. This guy's cool. And he just had this infectious smile about him. And the thing that I I, I thought was he loves the game so much that that would be a deterrent Mm. to to not screw this up. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas if you don't love it and you're a bad guy, Mm -hmm. that's one thing. Mm -hmm. Or you made mistakes and and, and you don't love it. He loved ball. Mm -hmm. He just had to get through. And listen, people come from different cultures. Mm -hmm. Some things that we just had to learn that Mm -hmm. that's where he came from. Mm -hmm. And... um, didn't mean he was a bad guy, and then actually turned out to be a great player and is still playing and, and was a multi-time Pro Bowl and made him the highest-paid safety at one t- point in the NFL. So it was a good story. You know, in the first round, he was a little risky. In the second round, he, uh, third round, he wasn't that bad of a guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we took a chance, and, and he paid off for us. You know, the character sometimes, like you're talking about what's inside, mm-hmm. and uh, I, I can remember a kid I'm coaching at Alabama, and his grades were not real great, and he was kind of on the borderline, but he, but he was going to be eligible. Uh, you know, as a high school kid coming to college. And I remember somebody, you know, I'm trying to make sure we admit him to Alabama. And, and this one guy that worked at Alabama looked over and said, Coach, he'll never graduate from here. And I said, hold on a minute now. How do you know that? Yeah. Like, how, do you know his background? Do you know where he came from? 
do you have any idea like he's never had a tutor he's yeah. never had certain things that other kids get at other places yeah so how can you say that it bothered bothered me and the yeah. kid ended up graduating and he went to graduate school and graduated from he got a master's degree but like you said sometimes it takes us to look a little deeper yeah and some things you you can't forgive there, there comes a point where sometimes when guys have some issues sure. but there's other times where like like that where your ability to look look a little deeper into yeah. somebody and find out what they're really about yeah that that kind of separates sometimes the guys like yourself who yeah. became an nfl executive of yeah. the year and yeah. some other guys yeah. because maybe they don't want to mm -hmm. or they don't want to get past one thing or the other thing yeah. so I'm yeah, sure no. you found that at times. No, and that was the question you had to ask yourself. At the very end, I got to a point where it was really quick. It was, is he a bad guy or did he just make a mistake? Or is he a bad guy and he's going to make mistakes again and he doesn't love it enough? Right. Again, I got to the point where passion was such a big deal to me. And um, still doesn't mean you can't miss. 51% of the NFL first round <laughs> picks are, are busts. And that's a low bar that I had when I had my analytics team run it. It was if you became a starter within three years of you being drafted, which is all it was for a first round pick, you would think he's a pro bowler. It was just if you started with, in the first three years as a full time starter, cannot forecast injuries, 51%. How about that? It's, it's, it's not a good rate, obviously. So let me go back. So now when you begin, you first started, you, you later became the general manager. But when you start off and you're a scout and, and uh, like everybody, uh, you're just probably working your butt off and, and trying your best to be the best you can be. And then opportunities are coming, yes. hopefully, mm -hmm. for yourself through the, through the organization or in other organizations yeah. around the league. So just talk yeah. about a little bit about that climb. Yeah, man, I was grinding. And, 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 and you know, it's funny because people think that the NFL is glamorous. And there are some things that are, that are obviously, you know, huge benefits. But, man, I, I'm staying in Hampton Inns and in, 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 uh, in, in Starkville, Mississippi, laying on top of the bed because I don't want to get under the sheets. And I'm packing my bag and I'm driving from, you know, Marshall University. I'm getting lost in the hills of Virginia. I mean, it, it's not it's not glamorous. And, um, you know, that was at times even before GPS. So I'm having the map out on my car hood and I'm trying to look at where I'm going. And I'm getting lost and frustrated. And you're up till two in the morning writing reports on your That's computer. Right. You're not you're not down at Oceans Forty Four mm -hmm. having a steak and a, and a glass of wine. Mm -hmm. You're grinding, mm -hmm. and um, so you're not sightseeing at all. And you know you, you, you grind, you grind, you grind, and then you have a little bit of time off in the summer, like a school teacher. But then you're ready to get back at it again. And it's um, those guys are the lifeblood of every organization, though, because mm -hmm. that you got to build through the draft to have success. Mm -hmm. How about? Uh at, at, when you became the general manager, I'm curious because in basketball it's a little different than football. But how many scouts then would you have out, you know, in the field doing and watching and evaluating and mm -hmm. submitting reports so that you yeah. you get as many reports and as many eyes on certain guys? Yeah, we wanted to have at least um, three scouting reports on, say, the top 200 players in the yeah. draft. Then we would, you know, sort of in, in incorporate the coaches uh, after the season. And I get the running back coach involved with all the top backs, maybe the top 15 backs in the draft. And, you know, the offensive coordinator, maybe see the top five or six draft mm -hmm. uh, drafted running backs. But, um, you know, I started off and we were bare bones. We had four area scouts and then we had like one guy over the top. By the time I became general manager in 2013, I told the owner, you know, we, we have got to, to cast a wider net. we got to have more coverage. And we ended up, I think, when I left, probably having about 18 scouts. Wow. Probably four pro personnel guys, and then the rest did the college, mm. the college game. Interesting. In basketball, when I worked for the Mavericks, and uh, Donnie Nelson was the president general manager, he hired me. And we would get on calls about every 10 days or so. And uh, at that time, Dallas, we, we knew we were going to have a high draft pick. And we ended up with the fifth pick that year it was Luka Doncic, by the way, mm -hmm. and Jalen Brunson, those two guys. Not bad. But uh, in that class, I remember the phone calls where uh, we would go around or get on, the, on a, on a uh, phone call. And the, and the question always was, or what he said is, okay, you got to rank your guys one through 10. I, I want your one through 10. Yeah. Now, every night I had to submit reports of one through 60. Sometimes I couldn't find 60 guys that I think could play That's in the it. NBA. That's I said, I mean. I, there's, there's not. I, I can get to 33. Right. And then after that, I'm just kind of, you know. But if you have the t – and, and we ended up with a fifth pick. But at one through 10, and I remember Donnie always saying to me, uh, Mark, if we end up with number one mm -hmm. or even two or three, or any pick in that high, those high picks, we, the lowest we could be was fifth, we cannot screw it up. Right. You better get it right. Like, we better get it right. People don't understand that yeah. a little bit. Like, when you end up with a draft pick, especially a higher pick, mm -hmm. the pressure 
that you're feeling. Yep. And it's not just pressure probably from your owner, but it's just internal pressure. No question. I, I want to get it right. Yeah. I want to get this right. And it's not an exact science. Oh. But I mean, did you feel an, that? Oh, like, man, I, I cannot. I want, I want to get this right. Listen, if the mailman misses delivering Mark Gottfried's mail, he ain't on ESPN. <laughs> but, but I'm on ESPN when I screw something up. And listen, you know, here's, here's the way I looked at it. I mean, again, it's such an inexact science. And, and if you're honest with yourself, player evaluation humbles you. If you're honest with yourself, and that's the only way you can self-grow as an evaluator, in my opinion, it's to look at your your misses and say, "Why did I miss?" Challenge yourself. And I would always be, our, you know, our scouts would, "Oh, he fit that scheme. That's why he's playing there." He does. No, 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 no. If he's playing ball and he's having success, you missed. Right. If you didn't like him, right. or vice versa, if you liked him and he didn't play, there's a reason other mm -hmm. than forecasting injuries. Mm -hmm. So we would get to a point where, you know, again, it was hard. I mean, listen, I I learned one of the hardest lessons in my life. I I came out swinging. Bruce Arians hired as the first head, head, my first head coach. Trade a seventh round pick for Carson Palmer. He lights it up and is like three time All Pro for us. We won over fifty games in five years. I'm I'm really good at this thing, right? I'm I'm, I'm good. I'm a smart guy. <laughs> Forty years old, one of the youngest GMs in the NFL. I'm I'm good, man. Man, Bruce retires. Carson retires. I don't have a quarterback. I wasn't very good. Yeah. And um, <laughs> it it was humbling. I, I that year uh, I tried to trade for Alex Smith, and then. You couldn't get him. John Gru or uh, Jay Gruden traded for him from from Washington uh, with Andy Reid. So then I, I tried to sign Sam Bradford, who I think had PTSD by that point because he'd been hit so much. <laughs> and Sammy could throw it, but he was just done at that point. And then I draft, drafted Josh Rosen out of UCLA. Mm -hmm. Josh Rosen had all the skills you like. He mm -hmm. could spin it. He's smart. He had all the the, the 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 sort of physical makeup. I'm just not sure he loved it that much. Mm -hmm. You know, he had a lot of other interests out there. So I took him with the 10th pick in the draft, and um, lo and behold, we see him play as a rookie. He doesn't fare so well. We fire a coach after his first year. Mm -hmm. A lot of things go wrong. Mm -hmm. So now all of a sudden I'm sitting there, and this is unheard of at this time. Mm -hmm. We're sitting there with the first pick in the NFL draft. I hire Cliff Kingsbury, who's a fired coach out of Texas Tech. So now all of a sudden, here's this GM who you, one time, two-time executive of the year, he thought he was pretty good, right? And now I'm lowering whale shit. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether I'm good or I. What do I? I'm throwing darts. <laughs> How am I going to build this team back up again? Got the first pick in the draft. So now all of a sudden, I hire a fired college coach and draft a midget quarterback with the first pick overall. <laughs> if you sit, put that on paper, you think I should be putting a straight jacket? I mean, I shouldn't be a GM. I should be putting a straight jacket. But lo and behold, man, the kid um, became rookie of the year, Kyler Murray, mm -hmm. uh, three time. Pro Bowler at that point in time, the first three years we had him, and propelled us to win in 11 games in, uh, I believe it was 2019, and, and going to the playoffs and sort of, you know, turned turn the organization around mm -hmm. at that time. Um, mm -hmm. Wasn't good enough still, but at, at the end of the day, he, he really did turn. But it's unheard of to draft mm -hmm. a kid in the first round at quarterback. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times I think in this business we get to a point where it's about you, it's about your ego. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about Steve Kime. This is about what's doing best for the Arizona Cardinals. Mm -hmm. And that was what was most important. And I mm -hmm. had to put my ego to the side, and that's tough. Because mm -hmm. obviously it doesn't look very good. Mm -hmm. it, doesn't, it doesn't look good on my resume. It doesn't look good. But I think it's helped people in the NFL to some degree. I'd like to think that they realize you can cut bait pretty quick, even mm -hmm. though it's a huge financial loss mm -hmm. and it's not what you want. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you got to rip the Band-Aid off and make a big decision. That's right. That's right. You do. How, how many times, Steve, because, uh, again, I go back to uh, a couple things. You know, when I was with Dallas, obviously, we all had input. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you know, it's like when you're a head coach. I can get input from my assistant coaches, but at the end of the day, i got to make a decision. Yeah, and here's what we're going to do, and here's how we're going to play. And, yes, I like that, and I'm, not, I'm sure I like that. Yeah. Same with scouting. We would all have input, but at the end of the day, Donnie Nelson, who was our GM and president with the Mavericks, or Mark Cuban, yep. you know, they listened. Mark, Mark Cuban read all the reports every night. I was shocked. You know, here's the owner of the team, and he's reading all the reports yeah. we do. But you get, somebody has to be able to pull that trigger. Mm -hmm. And when you sit in that seat, a little different no than question. that other seat. No question. <laughs> and now all of a sudden, see, you, you, as you're coming up the ladder and you started as a scout and you work all the way up, and now you're the GM, and, that again, that pressure to say, hey, pal, yeah, this one's on you. No question. I had how, all the answers when I sat in that chair. <laughs> how how many times? And I know every organization is different because every every owner is different. But how many times was there a uh, 
kind of a butting of the heads maybe between you and the owner. And, you know, he might say, hey, I want this guy. And, and you say, ah, I want this guy. And well, yeah, well, there were times that there were, you know, just questions. And, and sometimes, obviously, from there, everybody looks through through a different set of lenses. The owner's looking through it from ticket sales and revenue and wanting to do things like that. You know, the head coach is looking through, I want a guy to play now. I want to fill gaps that, of, of positional needs. Right. I'm looking at it as a three-year span of, we got to do what's best for the organization and draft the best player for the Arizona Cardinals moving forward. Mm -hmm. So everybody looks through a little different set of lenses. Um, so what I would do is, you know, again, I would listen to the scouts. I would listen to the coaches. Uh, owner obviously would always have input on not usually anything but the first or second round picks. Mm -hmm. And they'd just give you their ideas. Um, and you respect that. The shit, they pay the bills. Um, but then beyond that, you know, I like to hear the coaches because a lot of times coaches and scouts differed. You know, the coaches wanted the guy that was the guy who could process, could play different multiple spots, was smart. You could tell you on tape he did the right thing. Scouts, big, fast, explosive. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, we're looking for that talent. Mm -hmm. And um, at the end of the day, I had to take all of that input in. And in my best decision, again, take all that into account. And quite frankly, now all of a sudden it's an Arizona Cardinal decision. It's not just a Steve Kime decision, right. even though I had to make the call. Right. And I think what was really big in the end was – making sure everybody now all of a sudden is on board. Because somebody's going to be butthurt in that room, mm -hmm. you know, because there's always going to be a little bit of a difference of opinion. Mm -hmm. And I like Variance's opinions. That's mm -hmm. how you that, how you hash it out and you find mm -hmm. good players, mm -hmm. you know, to have the difference of opinion. Mm -hmm. And um, so I sort of encouraged that, and I wanted them to be strong at the table with their conviction. Yet at the end of the day, listen, once this boy's on the board, he's an 85 on the Cardinal grading scale, He's a, now that's, that's what the grade is. Respect mm -hmm. it. I remember sitting with Jeff Fisher. Uh, my son was – uh, my oldest son played football at Stanford, but he went to a camp at Vanderbilt. And Jeff's son, I think, was in the camp. And mm -hmm. we're sitting on this hillside watching the kids play, you know, high school kids. Mm -hmm. And I asked him that same question. And he talked about uh, it was the year I think it was Vince Young. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can't remember the other quarterback that year. But uh, he he wasn't excited about Vince Young. Yep. And uh, it was actually the owner's wife, <laughs> believe it or not, mm -hmm that kind of put the pressure and he told me the story and I actually kind of sat there a little bit like wow yeah. I mean hold on a minute now yeah and it was just kind of one of those things and he told me he said it's not often that it happens but sometimes yep. you know it, you know it's different in membership and ownership yeah well, when I'm the owner I can step in at times and uh, sometimes that's probably hard. Yeah. It's hard for a general manager. It's hard for a coach. And yeah. that's difficult. Well, I, I learned that, you know, you got to try to keep the peace with everybody, you know, and obviously you can't make everybody happy. Sometimes, you know, again, the owner writes the checks ultimately. So you sometimes have to decide whether you want to still work or not. Right. Secondly, I also learned a valuable lesson that I didn't, I learned to not force players down coaches' throats. Okay. Even if I really liked a guy, if a coach isn't on board with a player, it's going to be awfully difficult for that guy to have success. Mm -hmm. You know, once he gets through baggage claim, it's already got a target on him because that coach didn't like him in the draft process. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's hard sometimes for them to get over that ego part for them. Mm -hmm. We drafted a kid out of Virginia, Thomas Jones, a running back. I don't know if you remember Thomas. Mm -hmm. was a good player in the NFL. Mm -hmm. Went on to play at the Jets and, and the Bears and ended up being a pro bowler. Uh, I think he's an actor in L.A. now. But long story short, we take him with a six pick overall, and I think our running back coach wanted Ron Dane or somebody else like mm -hmm. that at that time. And um, from from the get-go, the bullseye was on him, and he never really had success in Arizona because he didn't get an opportunity, mm -hmm. you know, fair opportunity in mm -hmm. my opinion. So you learned on, you know, there's enough good players out there for us to all agree on, mm -hmm. you know, to a degree. You know, sometimes you got to be make a tough decision, but mm -hmm. you'd like to make sure everybody's on board, particularly the guy coaching them. We had, we had and, and again, I, when I was with Dallas, as a coach, too, because I coached for all the years, you know, I'm like you said, I, I'm trying to find, at first, I'm looking at guys that would fit, like, hey, we have a need for a two yeah. guard. Yeah. And I learned quickly, it was more about, we have to draft the best player. It's an asset. Yes. Because even if he doesn't pan out, we can trade him. He has value. Yes. I can get somebody else for mm -hmm. him because of who he might be. So that whole thing of trying to find the best asset out there. Yeah. And then we'll, we'll figure that out, you know, once we get the best players. Is that similar in football? Yeah, because here's the thing, you know, when, when you get in trouble when you start drafting and, and signing players based on need. Mm -hmm. Because now all of a sudden, needs are always evolving and changing. You know, your needs in, in, in April and May are different from your needs in, in September and October. But you can never have enough good players. That's right. You know what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. so a lot of times when you start forcing picks or you start forcing need, now all of a sudden you're taking a lesser mm -hmm. player, a lesser talent, and it's going to mm -hmm. hurt your football club. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. As you went through your career, Steve, and you had this amazing career, and uh, and so much is in uh, in front of you still uh, in football or, or yeah. whatever it may be, but uh, you know it's it's 
there's also like in my situation, in my, in my career, I had great moments, great wins, great successes. I had a great run. I'm never going to be the guy that's grumpy and bitter and, Hey, it didn't work out at NC state or it didn't work out here. You know, no. I, I just won't be that guy. No. I'm just not going to live my life that way. And I don't want anybody to ever steal my joy of no what question. happened, but there also are tough times. Yeah. And I can remember, uh, even at NC state, you know, I get fired yeah. and, uh, you know, I just want to go crawl up on my bed and lay there like in a fetal position. Yeah. And people don't realize that. No they, they don't understand like how hard that is. Yeah. And you've had some some great highs, then yeah. you've had some tough tough ones too. Yeah. It's it's part of life and but we learn from them. Yeah. That's how we get better. And yeah. we learn from what's happened in our experiences in our life. Yeah. Good and bad. No question. I went from having early success and living out my childhood dream that I that I predicted at 9 years old to being in the last years of my career and being in tears, having depression and anxiety, and wondering if I even like to do this anymore, which is really scary. You know, it's really scary. But now, you know, I've, I've, I've been able to, to have therapy and do different things that have helped me in my life, which has been great. I'm super happy right now. And more than anything, Mark, I'm grateful, man. Mm. I was one of 32 in the world. Mm. And guess what? I am so grateful. I'm thankful to God for that. You know, I live in Arizona. I have a beautiful family. You know, I still have the opportunity. To, I'm still a huge Cardinal fan. I mean, mm. 25 years I spent with that organization. So mm. I love the cards and uh, certainly rooting for them weekly. But, you know, more than anything, again, I, I, I'm so grateful that I – I mean, when my feet hit the floor in, during the, that time period, I'm like, man, I get paid to do this. Mm -hmm. I mean, people would, would, get, would want to mm -hmm. be, you know, lined up at the door wanting to be a general manager of an mm -hmm. NFL team. And I look back on it now, and again, you know, a lot of the fans probably don't love me because, you know, there were ups and downs <laughs> that the team had. But at the same time, man, I sure did love that organization. And I loved what I did. When we go through hard times, and, and I've been through a few in my life that are hard. I went through a divorce that was crippling for me for a while. Yeah. And I have five children. You know, I'm, I'm pouring everything I have into a job, you know, to coach. And most yeah. people like fans and different people, they don't realize how much – energy and passion we pour in yeah. they, they just don't get it yeah. you know they show up at game time they do their pom-poms and they cheer for the team and after the game they go home and eat a mm -hmm. cheeseburger and go to bed yep and what we're doing is is we're living it every day every, day. every minute and there's not a lot of time off mm -hmm. in what we do and now we get it you know those of us who are involved in sports like we understand yeah but the amount of time and like the passion you put into it and your energy mm -hmm. and one thing, just as I'm getting to know you well, what I've learned is, man, when you're in, you're in. I'm in. All in. Not halfway. Nope. And that's a part of who you are. But then we learn, too, from our struggles. And, like, for you, maybe some things that you learned through some of those tough times. And yeah. just maybe some lessons that, you, that now you're reminded of all the time because I, I went through hard times. And yeah. then bang, now all of a sudden, but I'm going to learn. No question. Ma maybe some of those for you. What, what would some yeah, of those be? You know, you know, I think, and again, you know, in the, in the National Football League, you don't have as many contests as basketball. So really, you, you know, uniquely to, to my life, as I'm just thinking about you saying living daily with it, man, you'd win a game on Sunday and you'd take a deep breath and say, okay, we got to win next week. <laughs> if you lost, it was the end of the world. Yeah. So you're living and dying on every loss, but the, the, the losses are the ones that just that crippled you. And what I learned is, you know, it's not always as good as it, as it seems to be, and it's not always as bad as it seems to be. you got to stay a little level-headed, which was hard for me because I'm an emotional guy. But, you know, now that I look back on things, I think one of the biggest things I've learned and I've created a little more patience in my life and became a little better person is to realize, you know what, man, it's really – you get worked up over real things that don't matter, mm. you know, that aren't important. What really does it matter? Mm -hmm. it, the big scheme of things, is this that important? Mm -hmm. Not really. Mm -hmm. You know, your health is, your family is, mm -hmm. and that's what's important. Mm. That's an amazing, it's an amazing lesson. And, uh, and it, those times we've had for me, uh, Steve, they, they, they were hard, but you get through it and you realize, like you said, the sun's going to come up yeah. again. You know, my Uncle Mike, uh, you mentioned, Mike Godfrey was a head football coach at Cincinnati and Kansas and Pittsburgh and went on ESPN and uh, just shot a podcast with him and my father. It was yeah. amazing. I had, a, I had a great time. But I remember him telling me early on after he got fired at Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. I said, Mike, if you ever got back into coaching, what would you do differently? And his first answer was, he said, Mark, I'm gonna, I, would, I would enjoy my wins more and I would try my best to let the losses go quicker. Yeah. Just what you just said. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? No question. And so then I, you know, I went from Alabama at NC State, and I'm trying my best to say, man, well, we just, 
man, we just beat North Carolina at North Carolina in the Dean yeah. Dome. Yeah. I want to enjoy this. Yeah. It's a Saturday night, but we, we got to play Virginia yeah. on Wednesday. Yeah. No I don't question. have enough time to enjoy it. No question. And uh, that's another one that people don't really understand. And you, you said it so well as far as when you win, it's that next thing, yeah. that next, it's, yeah. it's coming. Yeah. And, and that's it, one of the first things that, you know, I had a therapist say to me. They said, once they got to know me, they said, Steve, what, what, what's next? Like, what, why is it always got to be what's next? Mm. Why can't it be live in the moment, enjoy this? Enjoy being with Mark Gottfried right now, a guy who you admire the hell out of, and enjoy this conversation and relish it. Instead of just thinking, okay, after this, I got to go do this, do that. No, man, enjoy this moment. This is special for me, mm. you know. And that's that's what we got to get better at in life. Especially I had to. It was always wasn't that. How many cars do I need? How big a house do I need? What do I need? How much more money do I need? No, man, enjoy your kids. Enjoy the time you have. Time mm. is undefeated. Mm. Isn't that amazing? No doubt. And your children too. Like for all of us in coaching, you know, they go through it too. Oh, they yeah. they go through it. They understand it, and no they person. hurt. Yeah. When dad hurts, I hurt. Yeah. And. Uh, you know, when I left Alabama and we'd been there 11 years and, and I had two kids that were getting ready to go to college and they were like, nope, I'm not coming here. I, I don't want to go there. Yep. They, they hurt mm -hmm. for you. And I'm yeah. sure your family, too. You, they see the ups and downs. They mm -hmm. see, um, you know, how exciting and amazing yeah. and exhilarating this one, a win can be. But then they also yeah. see dad over here, too, where, yeah. man, it's a struggle sometimes. Yeah. And, Particularly uh, when they got to an age where they could start reading some of the stuff, and yeah. those chat boards and those social media got bigger, where people can just say whatever they want. You know, not so much that maybe dad is a, is a, is a bad GM, but sometimes people then become personal, and that mm -hmm. gets a little tough for those mm -hmm. those youngins to to sort of handle. And I understand it, but at the same time, you know, hopefully through some of that, it builds them to be a little stronger. You know, that it sort of thickens their skin. Mm -hmm. When you were when you were working with the Cardinals, did you in the organization did you guys understand how big the NFL has always been big, mm -hmm. and um, but how big it was. And I'm going to tell you where I learned how big it was one time. I, I'm playing golf at Augusta, believe it or not. And it's my father and uh, Mike Shula and his father, Don Shula. Mm -hmm. So we do a father-son at Augusta. How about that day now? Wow. And I had a friend of mine who was a member. And so we go over there. But at night, you go to dinner. It's 8 o'clock. We, we go in, and the members have their green jackets on, and they have, everybody has to wear a coat and tie for dinner. Mm -hmm. 8 o'clock. you got to be in your seat. Yeah. So I'm sitting there at dinner, and right behind me, I've got Sean Connery. Yeah. Wow. That's a pretty big, that's a pretty big deal. He's right <laughs> yeah. here. Then over here, I've got the oldest living member of the Ford family. I've got a uh, uh, guy that was in Ronald Reagan's cabinet. I mean, the, the crowd in there was unreal. But right beside me, I've got Don Shula. And as the evening went on, everybody in the place wanted to meet Don Shula. No everybody. Question. That's awesome. Not Sean Connery. Not this guy. Everybody was getting up, and there's probably a dinner at Augusta, in, you know, in an evening, maybe, yeah, I don't know, 40, 50 people in, in, a, in a dining room there, you know, yeah. we're eating together. And a coat and tie. And everybody throughout the night, they just wanted to come over and say, Coach, I just want to meet you, Don Shula. And I'm with Mike, who, you know, I've known Mike forever. We, Mike Shula and I were, were students together at Alabama. He was a quarterback. I was a guard on the basketball team. But I just remember that night thinking, good gosh, this – this is a big. This is a big deal. It's amazing. It's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And the, in the NFL in our country, how big it is. Mm -hmm. Did you always feel that when you were in the NFL? Yeah. Did you, did you get a sense of that it, when you're in it? Yeah, I, I, to a degree, maybe not as much as I look back on it now. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you one of the one of the interesting things is is um, uh, Bruce Arians last year coaching, uh, and Carson Palmer's last year. We played in London against the Rams. And we go, and this this is, shows you globally how big the mm -hmm. NFL is. Mm -hmm. We go to this pub as an organization, you know, myself, the owner, Bruce Arians, and there's literally 6,000 people busted out of this pub all around with this stage up top that we speak to these people, okay? There's the British Bird Gang, Cardinal fans coming in from Germany. They're coming in from London. They're coming in from Paris. The NFL is that big globally. Mm. And I get up on stage and they start chanting, Kime, 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 Kime. <laughs> And I'm like, these people are all from Germany. They're again, they're not Americans. <laughs> and, and and one of the things that helped is we did a show called uh, All or Nothing on Amazon, and uh, this was in 2016. And that show was so big and so international that those fans knew all about us. They knew about my family. They knew about all those things just because of that show. And uh, again, the NFL was second to none. When I worked at ESPN, I was at ESPN two years, and I remember somebody, I was in Bristol, Connecticut, at ESPN, and they were telling me, he said, Mark, we can put a show on television on ESPN about the NFL. 
we can put it on any time of the day in any month of the year. <laughs> it's it'll be our highest rated shows. Period. <laughs> and I'm right. a basketball thinking. Wait a minute, what? Really? Yeah. Any time of the day we put NFL on, we get the highest ratings. Isn't when, that unreal? When I first started scouting uh, in 1998, you know the, the combine was sacred. Scouts in there only, no fans, and no no fanfare. Nobody talked about it. We had all that information. It was confidential data. He jumped this. He ran this. Every team held it with 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 uh, with a lot of uh, security. And I would have never imagined that people would sit down on their couch and watch guys in their underwear running around 40 times, short shuttles, oh my God, he vertical 38. You know, and there are more people, they said, that watch that than like Major League Baseball playoffs. And I would have never imagined that. Now they're filling up the stadium, it's a huge revenue builder. Yeah, when you were in the league, and uh, obviously a ton of, ton of great players, uh, but in your, in your run there, during your mm -hmm. that near decade or so yeah. when you're the GM, and your years before that as well, but during that time, and that was also kind of in that era where mm -hmm. Tom Brady and Bill yeah. Belichick, they're rolling. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're rolling, rolling. No question. Like maybe, maybe unlike any other little run we've seen, we've seen it from other teams at times, but that run was pretty strong. Yeah. Um, in your mind, was that, was that the organization that you're like, good golly, man, they're good. Now they have a great quarterback, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. But the system and the players and, yeah. and the way they built it, you know, yeah. it just didn't happen. It yeah. just didn't poof it all of a sudden mm -hmm. they, they become who they are right but they were were they kind of a franchise that people looked at and, and kind of said how do we how do we catch them i don't think there's any question and, and and if you look back on it and we did a lot of analytical work on it they didn't always have some of the greatest drafts in the world but bill was such a great coach and and they they did everything such in such a proficient way and Tom obviously was so special. It was like the perfect storm. And when you see these shows now about Tom and Bill and how it wasn't one, it was both, it, it's true. I don't think it was just one. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously the quarterback helps. Mm -hmm. But Bill Belichick was a phenomenal coach and obviously one of the best of all time. When you went through, uh, I think one of your, your years, I think you guys did the hard knocks. Yeah. How, tell me about how, how that p plays in because – on one hand, I'm looking. I'm a fan. I'm a fan. Yeah, I'm an NFL sure, fan, sure. and I, but I coach, so I'm around in basketball. I say that's an amazing thing for the fans, for everybody, for the whole country. They get yeah. an inside look. Yeah. They're listening to conversations, some of your conversations, yep. coaches, players. Mm -hmm. But this also can be a little bit intrusive. No question. A little bit. Mm -hmm. Like even for me as a coach, I want cameras to come. I'm, I might want them to come in, but maybe not all the way. Yeah. Talk a little bit about the hard knocks uh, that, that with you guys. I mean, I, I love it from a fan perspective because there's nothing like peeling back the curtain. I mean, that's what it's all about, right? Mm -hmm. and, and seeing the things that you and I get to experience in our daily life, which is pretty special. Yet at the same time, I'd be lying if I told you it didn't make me do my job differently. Yeah. And I did it twice. So Amazon, the all or nothing was actually more intrusive than the hard knocks because I was mic'd almost every second of the day. And... Uh, I'll never forget Bruce Arians and I were at the combine one day and we were walking out of a place eating lunch and a guy stopped us on the street and he said, hey, coach, Steve, how you doing, man? He's like, I did, uh, I did all the, um, he, uh, you know, the, the voiceovers and the background stuff for All or Nothing, the show for NFL films. He said, man, I'd love to go to that bar, the living room you guys go to. It was just because he would hear everything we talked about all day, and he knew e they hear every detail. And you're scared to death. And finally, yeah. like what makes yeah. it to the to the yeah, to the finishing right. room? That's right. Yeah. So yeah. you do, you, you, and you got to worry about conversations you have with players. You don't want to mm -hmm. disrespect anybody. You don't mm -hmm. want to hurt anybody's feelings. Mm -hmm. And then you obviously, you know, you got to then deal with how do fans perceive you? How do you, if you go back as a player, scout, front office, all the way to GM, and uh, and part of your success, obviously, and I'm going to coach, so this will be great. I I'm, 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 can't wait to ask you this one. But in your mind, what qualities make a great coach? Qualities make a great coach. Um, I'm a little more old school, so I still think there's a strong um, argument that the the combination I know it's probably not answering your word the leadership and account holding players accountable mm. these guys still want to be coached hard mm. but it's getting harder and harder to do as you know the video game world the participation trophy bullshit that we have that's bad ball that's bad that sets a bad precedent but but the Larry Fitzgeralds and the Carson Palmers and some of the guys that I was around the great ones you know the the Hall of Fame players. Uh, 
they thrived on being challenged. Whereas, you know, at the pat on the back and the, hey, it's okay, we'll get them next time. That's not, that's not coaching. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's where I really see a big difference in the game today and, and sort of the mindset. But that's holding guys accountable, being hard on them, and having expectations. And there's nothing wrong with having expectations. That's what we pay you for. This mm-hmm. is a business. Mm-hmm. Even in pro sports, because, first of all, professional sport, the guys are getting younger and younger, especially in basketball. You know, a lot of guys that are playing, they should still be in college. But anyway, they're, they're younger guys. But part of, I always felt, too, is that relationship that I had with a player yeah. where that guy will respond to me. Yep. Because I always felt like if he didn't, if he didn't feel like I cared about him no personally, individually, no not as a basketball player, but if he believed I really had an interest in him yeah. in helping him, sometimes those guys, and they'll, they'll run through a wall no because they care, because they know you care about them. Yes. Same in the NFL? No question. And here, here, here's, here's what I think people underestimate. Coaches nowadays, or coaches have always made really good money in the NFL. And I think people underestimate how talented you have to be as a football coach or a basketball coach to hold players accountable and be hard on them, yet still have that ability to pat them on the back or put your arm around them and get them to buy in to you feeling that they lo- you love them as well. Mm-hmm. You know, Bruce Arians was phenomenal at that, the best I've ever been around. He was hard as hell on players. But then he had a ch- you know, had ability to pat him on the ass, say, let's go get a beer, baby, and act like nothing happened. But also they knew that he loved them and he cared, and that's why he cared about the football, not the personal. It was the football that he wanted him to get better at. And he was able to separate the two. And, and to make him feel that he – sort of like my college coach, man. I, I had one of the best line coaches in the country at NC State. I thought he hated me my first three years. <laughs> my, 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 my final year at NC State playing, I realized, you know what, man, this guy loved me. He, that, that's why he was so hard on me. Yeah. And uh, that's why I think I told you last night, I, shit, I, I flew into Vegas at his retirement. I gave him a Rolex with an engraved back that said, 43 years coaching, two national champions, you will always be my coach. And that guy made me want to – He, I wouldn't be an NFL GM without Bobby Caldwell. Wow. You know what's amazing about that too, Steve, is there's a lot of players. And you, you have something inside of you, because as I'm getting to know you, that you really do care and, and you, you have this passion. Yeah, but there's a lot of players that can't look back to people like that and give them the credit. You know? Yeah. They, and that's okay. Yeah. But I love to hear I, – I, I do. I love to hear the fact that sometimes players – you know, I remember I'm coaching at Alabama, and I got this kid from Memphis, really good player. Didn't play a lot as a freshman, sophomore, but, boy, as a senior, he was good. Had 37 against Mississippi State one night. I mean, a good player. and Wonderful family, mom and dad. And I remember when he got done playing, his mother called me. Uh, her name was Mallory, and Mallory called, and she said, Coach, I just want to thank you. And, and I'm, I'm a little bit taken aback. Because it just mm-hmm. it was rare, yeah. And she said, "I just want to thank you for how you treated my son, and how you helped him mature, and how you helped him become a better player." Yeah. But some, and, and I was so appreciative. I still remember it. I yeah. still remember the phone call. But for you to go back and look at the people along the way that have helped you, yeah, it's important because um, none of us would be where we are without those people no doubt. that have helped us. No doubt. And, and you know that the hard part about a general manager position in the NFL is a lot of times, let's be honest, it doesn't end well for players because of whether they're you know sort of diminishing skills after a while, they get to a certain age or certain injuries, and they're making a lot of money, you got to make some tough decisions. So that becomes personal, unfortunately, sometimes, you know, where they take it personal and then all of a sudden it fractures a relationship. But for example, an introductory press conference, I'm named general manager of the Arizona Cardinals. Before I even hire a head coach and get a quarterback, I have to go up to my office and I have to make the toughest decision I had to make in my NFL career. I had to cut one of my closest friends, mm. a guy that went to NC State named Adrian Wilson. He's in the ring of honor. He's six-time all-pro safety at the Arizona Cardinals. And then because of a salary cap and he was diminishing in his, his skills, his age and mm-hmm. those sort of things, I had to get on the phone and I had to cut one of my closest friends. Mm. And I'll tell you this. It was a lot of tears in that conversation. And we, we then signed him to a one-day contract. He retired a Cardinal. This was a couple years later. And he sat there at that press conference and he said, I knew Steve Kahn was right for the job when he cut me because I knew how hard that decision was for him. Mm. And for him to be able to make that tough decision showed me what he was built, what, was, what was he was made of. And, man, I, I almost cry thinking about that right mm-hmm. now. Isn't that amazing? Oh. I tell this story, Steve, and uh, a little bit about it relates to what you just said. When I was the graduate assistant coach at UCLA and 
Jim Herrick was the head coach. He just hired me. I'm the first year, and I'm just learning. And, you know, I want to coach, and, you know, I'm yeah. excited and, you know, all that. And we were playing on the road at Cal, and I got sat in the seat right beside him on the bus. We were going over to shoot around 11 o'clock, just do a little walkthrough, you know, that, that mid-morning there. And I leaned over and asked him, I said, what's the biggest difference between being an assistant coach and a head coach? Mm-hmm. And I wanted this amazing answer. And I was, I was ready for this elaborate answer, and he just looked right at me and said, lonely. That was his answer. No question. And then later when I became a head coach, it's like when you become the GM Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden that decision you had to make, like that one you talked about, where you got to make a decision on one of your best friends Mm -hmm. who's a player. Yeah. All of a sudden, man, that office, that office can get lonely. Oh, and that office can get taboo. (laughs) All of a sudden, too, those assistant coaches, they're hovering around my scouts, but they don't want to come down and talk to me. Or, or, you know, they're, they're, or the scouts don't want to come talk to me because they're worried they're going to get fired or something's going to happen or I'm going to get upset with them. Like you said, lonely. And it's interesting because one of the questions you asked your dad and your uncle um, I thought was a great question. You know, what would you have done differently? And I had to think about that just a little bit ago. And I started to think to myself, you know what? If I really had to be critical of myself, I really wish I would have. And I thought I did a good job of it. But, Mark, I wish I would have spent a little more time paying it forward sitting around with my scouts and talking about Mm. some of the tough decisions I got to make. And when you're in this position, here's how I look at it. And, and, and sort of, again, educating those guys on what it takes to sit in that chair. And I think I did it. Okay. But I look back and I think I could have been better. Mm. Cause there's so much to learn so much. And there is no, there is, you sit down, there is no manual how to be a GM, bro. You, you, you are sometimes it's man. I I remember I'd sit in my office sometimes like this and my owner would come around the corner and say, so you want to be a GM, huh? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I signed up for it. We all block out as coaches. We block it out. And uh, the, the, the fans and the people and opinions, and we, we just learned the ability to, to not really pay attention. Yeah. And sometimes people would get offended by that. Like, they, they jumped all over me at NC State. We had beat North Carolina on the road. We'd go to Boston College, get beat. They weren't very good. Yeah. And I remember a guy in the media at NC State, and uh, it's actually funny because we've kind of – you know, we've become friends later. But while I was coaching there, he well, I, would, I didn't like him. He didn't like me, I don't think. But he asked me a question about, well, what do you think the fans will think about this loss? And my answer was, I don't really give a shit about the fans. <laughs> no doubt. And, it, it, you know, <laughs> I remember everybody's like, whoa, how about that answer? But truly, we, we learned to block that out. And it's not that we don't care. Yeah. We care. Oh, I care. But I, I can't listen to everybody's opinion on what I should be doing and who I should be playing and we should be doing this and that. And, you know, nobody knows your team, you know, like you guys yeah. that are inside the building. No question. But we have that ability just to say, not, not you're o- there, not only but that, you're not really there. Not only that, and then the decision making, whether it's free agency and the draft process, you almost have to quit watching ESPN because that stuff will get in your head mm-hmm. if you allow it to. How, 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 how many times would this have happened, Steve? Because I, I remember, again, I – I left NC State. I go up to Philadelphia, and I had a kid, Dennis Smith uh, uh, Jr., great player. Kind and of Fayetteville, uh, right? Huh? Fayetteville, right? Yeah, yeah. Fayetteville, wonderful, wonderful young guy. I love him. Yeah. And um, he's probably in his eighth or ninth year now in the NBA. But that year, Lonzo Ball and Markel Folks in basketball were the two guys that all of a sudden everybody's talking about their one-two, one-two, yeah. one-two. And Philadelphia flies me up. I go up. I'm sitting in the office with uh, Brian Colangelo and some guys in Philly, and they're asking me, he said, well, Coach, uh, out of these two guys, who would you take if you had number one? And I said, neither one. And they're like, well, what do you mean? I said, I'm taking Jason Tatum, number one, if I have number one pick. Yeah. I'm not taking either one of them two guys. Right. And I recruited both of them. So I, I knew them from ninth, 10th, 11th grade. I, I knew I sat in the gym and watched Markel Folks get, get beat nine straight pickup games by ninth graders. And I'm like trying to figure out if he can play at NC State. But I remember going in there, but in football, like you mentioned with television and everything, people start, it almost becomes where everybody agrees that this guy should be number one or this guy should be number two. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, I'm not sure I agree with that. But when the momentum gets going, sometimes it's hard to then to go against that momentum. It's not only from a media perspective, that momentum can get going in a draft room and it's hard to slow down. And you're like, whoa, 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 let's take a deep breath here and step back. I mean, it's, you know, the beauties in the eye beholder, as we always say, but at the same time, I mean, listen, 51% failure in the first round tells you that the hurt is not right. 
You know what I mean? It's, it, it is an inexact business that, that is really built on, you know, again, those things that you miss on that are hard to, to – the human element is extremely hard to judge. Yeah. And um, that's where we fail, and, and it's, it's, it's always going to be – nobody's ever going to get it right. Yeah. It's always going to be an inexact science. Um, we had, uh, when I was at NC State, I want to say it was Herm Edwards, I think, which you, you know Herm yeah. uh, very, very well. But I think he was coaching at the Jets. He told mm-hmm. me the story, and uh, I think it was in that game when uh, – I'm going blank. you got to help me right here. Uh, Bledsoe, I think, the quarterback with the Patriots when he got hurt. Yeah. Yep. And they put Tom Brady in the mm-hmm. game. Yep. And he joked with me and said, I always tell Belichick, if we didn't knock the other guy out of the game, you would have never put Brady in. Yeah. And so sometimes even that, there's a guy that's – He's, he's in a uniform. He's on the roster. There's no question. But I'm not playing him. Yep. And sometimes we play him, and all of a sudden we all kind of, if we're really honest, if no we're question. really, really honest, you go, I should have been playing that guy a long time ago. <laughs> it happens. Listen, I thought I was a tremendous talent evaluator, <laughs> still do. But, man, did I miss on a lot of players. We all and, did. And, and listen, Wally Pip, it's the, you know, the, old, yeah. the old stories that you know guy gets an opportunity, he makes the best of it. And it's happened over and over and over again. Uh, so whether you like it or not, and it will continue to happen. And that's, that, that's honestly, sometimes, too, it's the greatest thing about these sports, you yeah. know, that you have that excitement, the yeah. challenges, and yeah. the things you can't sort of forecast. Talk a little bit, too, Steve, like now that uh, you've stepped away, you're, you're not with the Cardinals right now, but you've got some amazing opportunities. And yeah. I don't know if you can talk about all of them on the air. But, you know, what, one thing you, that I've learned, too, is, you know, I coached for 30, I think it was 35 straight years. I didn't come up for air. I mean, yeah. I, didn't, I never came up for air. Yep. Then you get out of it, and you're, for me, you know, it's been a struggle a little bit. Yep. But at the same time, you're finding things in life that are exciting. Exactly. It's like, wow. I mean, even my podcast, I, I love what I'm doing. Like, this is just an amazing, yeah. I'm getting to know yeah. and learn people's stories. Yes. So I love it. So for you, you've got some things, yeah. you know, hopefully coming for you mm-hmm. that, that I think are going to be exciting and rewarding yeah yeah i think there's going to be some things that uh, hopefully happen that um you know just some conversations in the television world that um you know whether it's producing and, and helping out with some shows uh, you know with football storylines and then uh, the number one thing I'm doing right now is I started a company called Brand Boss, and it's essentially it's a it's an evaluation sort of package that these high school kids because I want to give back. You know, it's not about making the money anymore. Now it's about let me give back to these high school kids. Everybody thinks their kids going Division One. They're all freshmen in high school. Everybody's going Division One. I'm paying money to this trainer and that guy and sending them away to this camp. Listen, I'll, I'm watching the tape of these kids. And I'm giving them an honest valuation. Sometimes it's not what they want to hear, unfortunately. Sometimes, but it's helping the parents understand where their kid is or what he has to do to get better. So www.brandboss-nil.com. That's my little simple love plug. Love and uh, go to Kime Time, and it's a package. And again, I'm, I love working with these high school kids. I love mm-hmm. giving back to the, to, to the process and to the, helping them understand what it takes to be a player, mm-hmm. whether it's college level, pro level. And um, it's, it's fun because now I get to know more kids and more people, and I don't have the stress that comes with sort of the obstacles in the relationship. You know? do, you, do you find in that, Steve, like parents, because uh, I'm around young people all the time and have been, but um, I used to kid everybody and say, you know, the guys I coach, they, they think they're Michael Jordan, but their parents think they're better. Yeah, there's, you know? there's no and, doubt. And you're, you're working with young kids now, high school guys and some parents sometimes, and I get it, man. They want their child to, to achieve a high level, but, you know, sometimes they're, they're, they're trying to find all the tricks of the trade as opposed to just getting good. Yeah. My, 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 my number one sales pitch was, number one, listen, uh, longtime general manager of the National Football League. I could call Kirby Smart tomorrow. Could have called Nick. You know, I had those relationships. And my son is a freshman at Arizona State as a preferred walk-on. And he was a borderline Division One one AA player, in my opinion. Um, he's doing really well so far. But at the same time, if they didn't do me a favor by giving my kid a scholarship, mm-hmm. they're not going to do your kid a favor. Mm-hmm. And I got to let them understand that I got to educate you about the process. Now there's NIL, and that's a whole different world. The mm-hmm. transfer portal is creating more issues where less kids are being recruited out of the high school level. I think Colorado signed four kids last year mm-hmm. out of high school and mm-hmm. took the rest out of the portal, which we're now a whole different side. We're getting into the pro free agency. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you just want to give back, help the parents understand what the process is, what it takes to be a good player. And, um, you know, that's gratitude for me. I feel, I, feel, I feel excited to do that because I'm getting something out of it. And you're still able as a as a uh, all the things you're good at, you know, evaluating yeah. players because that's we've all done it. You've done it. I've done it I've, my whole life. That's all I've ever done is evaluate players. But 
you're now involved with some of these young kids and you can start to see that kid's got something in there. Yeah. And maybe that kid's really talented, but yeah. missing. Yeah. And uh, but boy, that one there, man, he's got something in there. Yeah. And then you get to see it a little differently because yeah. you're a little bit you get a little more hands on yeah. with what you're That's doing. That's exactly right. And I always say this. I mean, when our area scouts would go into a school, uh, maybe I thought I was a better evaluator, but they're in there and they talk to the secretary. They talk to the janitor. They talk to the weight coach. They talk to the coach. Mm -hmm. They walk out of that school with intimate knowledge, and there is a much stronger feeling about a player than me sitting in my office throwing on six tapes. Mm -hmm. You get to touch and feel and taste that guy, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. When I was, uh, again, uh, scouting, you know, it was the, the most important thing was the intel. Yeah. You know, we all we all can kind of see whether this guy's better than that guy. Okay, we get that. Yeah. But then, what what comes behind the curtain? Yeah. But now you, you're seeing it with these young guys too, and yeah. you're able to tell them and teach them. Yeah. And uh, I have fun doing that. Yeah. You know, I've kind of adopted a team here, right here in Newport Beach, Corona Del Mar High School basketball yeah. team. I love it. You know, yeah. and I'm a fan. I'm right. just a fan. I sit in the stands and cheer. Yeah. But when I get to talk to the team or talk to the individuals, you know, it's such a it's a lot of fun because yeah. I, want, I just want to help. I just yes. want to help them. I'm not yep. coaching. I'm not, I'm not, they have great coaches, great coaching staff, but I just want to help young people. That's it. And again, uh, trying to give back, pay it forward. And people have helped me no throughout question. my whole life. Yeah, and, I, owe uh, I owe it to, I owe it to the game. Yeah. The game's much bigger than any of us. And, and, and it did so much for me in my life and put mm -hmm. me in a great position that I owe it to, to the game. I owe it to myself. I owe it to my family. And I, I owe it to the youth of America to help that we continue to get, get better mm -hmm. and better and better and become more professional and understand, get off your phones, get off the video games and get out there and work your ass off. <laughs> get good. Yeah, get just good. Get good. Just get good. Usually, it, usually good things will happen. Yeah, you just get good. That's the bottom that's, line. That's right. Well, let me say this here. We're going to, we're going to close this up, but Steve, I, I'm so thankful. And, um, you know, obviously we have the NC state connection. Yeah. Uh, you played there and you know, I coached there, but, uh, man, incredibly proud of you and what you've done throughout your career. And, I truly believe, Steve, you got you have things coming. And it may be back in football. It may be back as an NFL executive. You were an yeah. NFL executive of the year multiple times. And, you know, your career speaks for itself. But yeah. I, I do think there's going to be some amazing things that uh, sometimes you don't even know they're there yet. And yeah. they're, they're going to come. They're yeah. going to come your way. And so uh, I'm hoping the best for you, man. Well, I appreciate it. And I, I, like I told you, I promise myself I am going to appreciate moments like this that are special to me. And I'm going to continue to smell the roses. There you go. Well, thank you, man, for coming in. And uh, it was a great one today. So thank, thank you, you. That was great.